Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy Miss Utah showed. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Because they said if she didn't, I had to wear heels for this presentation. So <laughs> I appreciate everybody joining today. I do want to note the AC in this building is out, so it's going to get a little stuffy, which actually is better. It helps me move the conversation quicker to keep everybody entertained. So that's my bio. Um, I'm from Michigan. So if you ever met anybody from Michigan, I'm from here. Uh, I'm from outside Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I came west after I graduated high school, and I, I decided to focus my PhD on the Chinese experience in Montana because of two reasons. One is the real reason, one is the passion I learned from it, is after I graduated with my Master's of Science in Industrial Archaeology, my old friends in Montana said, you need to come back to Montana. We just started a brand new PhD program. I'm like, that sounds great. She's like, do you have uh, interest in Chinese archaeology? Like, I have no idea what it is, but I'll learn it. And then she's like, we have money. I'm like, I'm there. Um, <laughs> that is not to belittle my passion that grew out of that project that I started in 2005. Um, I did four years of PhD at the University of Montana, and I did a little bit of a theatric. I walked into my dissertation defense with all the old history books of Montana. 3,000 pages, going back to 1885. It was the actually oldest Western history book. And I plopped it on the table. How many pages were dedicated to the Chinese? I challenged my committee. Not a smart thing to do. Um, and I said, how many pages is dedicated to the Chinese contribution to our greatest state of Montana? And I'm like, oh, 50, 60, 10 pages. Spread across 3,000 pages and not even cohesive pages. A paragraph here, a sentence there, an anecdote here. The Chinese were treated as nothing more than an anecdote in Montana history, even though when you look at the census records from 1870, one out of every 10 Montanans was Chinese. If you were in Helena, the capital, which wasn't the capital yet, one out of every five Montanans was Chinese. But by 1900, that demographic had changed. Our country had turned against these immigrants who helped form our country into the industrial powerhouse it was by the end of the 19th century. So we went from one out of 10 in 1870 to one out of 200,000 by 1900. And I'm gonna to talk to you about what happened to lead to that. Now I can keep you here for about eight to 10 hours because I am a class A royal nerd. And the Silver Reef folks really asked me to kind of paint the broader picture. Like, I'm not an expert in Silver Reef's Chinatown. I'm not an expert in some of these smaller communities, but I see the big picture, and I've spent the last five years working uh, here. I've been for the state for 10 years. I've been managing our preservation office for the last three. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time working with our partners at the Bureau of Land Management up in the northwest part of our state on the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, and in 2021, we actually did something really neat. We conducted the first full excavation of a Chinese home on the Transcontinental Railroad in American history. Um, but that tells you that that's 2021. And we are just barely starting to uncover the contributions of these Chinese workers made to our country. I work collaboratively with the Chinese community in Salt Lake City, the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendant Association, which is a very rewarding part of my job. A lot of Archaeologists, we do important work, but oftentimes it's not meaningful work. I find what I do meaningful, reconnecting these folks to their history, to the physical place that their ancestor, that due to the racism of this country, we don't know their name. We don't know if they died here. We don't know what happened to them if they went home, if they stayed here in most cases. So I'm going to paint the broad picture uh, in the next 40-ish minutes of the Chinese experience here in the United States, but it, it follows in Canada, it follows in other parts of the dispersal of the Chinese during this period. Um, this is uh, Main Street in Salt Lake City in the 1890s. Um, it's a 4th of July parade with a Chinese float. The Chinatown in Salt Lake has been eradicated by urban renewal in the 1950s. And so we've systematically removed most evidence of these important pieces of our history because we pushed them out. And I'm gonna talk you through that. But I always like to start with the why. 
I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing a lot of folks. I bet there's Jansons and Hensons and all these McCormicks and McDonald's. Like we know our history. We fled Europe for one reason or another, whether to seek uh, investment in a new faith or because of death, famine or war. Well, we don't think about why were the Chinese even in our country. So I'm going to take us all the way back to uh, 1611. I'm going to go back to the mid uh, 17th century. So China, as we know it, really formed with what's called the Qing Dynasty. That's when China pretty much stretched its elbows to its current boundaries, including Mongolia. The problem with the Qing Dynasty was that it was led by the Manchus, Northern Chinese. It's an ethnic minority if you look at the totality of China. The Southern Chinese, the Han, the primary ethnic group, were the ethnic majority, but they became under the rule of these Manchus, the Northern Chinese. Well, that creates a problem. If you have 20% of the population ruling 80% of the population, there's a natural friction that occurs within a society. Um, so when we think of China, I really want you guys to take a step back, is when these folks arrived on our shore in the 1850s, they did not see themselves as Chinese as the way we saw them as Chinese. They came from different villages, different clans, different language groups, but as soon as they arrived on our shore, they became one solid thing. Even though the internal structure of those Chinese communities were in conflict, varied, different religions, everything. But once they arrived here, our society said, you're the same thing. And that is an important aspect as we move through this because so much of that inter-Chinese, that, that internal issue, we don't know how these folks work together. Because there's old family issues going back centuries in China that now you had to live together in urban Chinatown surrounded by a bunch of white folk that would just as soon you know, use you as target practice as work with you. So it creates a hard, hard issue. So why did the Chinese even start coming to the United States? I'm just gonna pull statistics for you. So 1810 to 1811, we don't know the number that died in a really bad famine that was caused by drought. So the Qing Dynasty heavily invested in really industrial agriculture. The population of China doubled within 100 years. So at the time that we were barely starting as a country, there was 200 million in China. Um, that puts it in perspective when I say, we don't have the exact number, but in a couple famines, 45 million likely died in that period. We get better numbers between 1850 and 1873, 10 to 30 million died in famine. And so you can see these numbers, but I wanna put my ancestors, my Irish ancestors that I come from, my potato stock, the famine that we learn so much about in history, the Great Irish Famine, only costs about a million lives. Put that in perspective to what the Chinese were dealing with in the 19th century. 50, 60 million dying in famine and related diseases. That's a big issue, right, for a population trying to make itself work. Well, another issue occurred. You learned this probably in school as the Opium Wars. I hate that term because that term originated in the 19th century. We started tagging Chinese immigrants in a connection with opium because it made it easier for us to pick on them, right? If we, can, if we connect somebody to a drug, fundamentally, we have superiority over those people. This was not an opium war, this was a trade war. So with the Qing Dynasty, they kind of closed their borders in the 1700s and said, we're not gonna trade with these European powers because we want to invest in ourselves. It was a very Confucius, Confucian ideal. Invest in yourself, invest in your community. The whole hierarchy of Chinese life was at the top you had you know, the emperor and scholars and diplomats. At the very bottom of the social scale were merchants, people that were out for personal profit. Look at the rest of the colonial world, thunk, right? The people with the most power and influence are those with the money, the merchants. And so it was completely disconnected from a Western style of thought. Well, the British Empire did not appreciate that. You know, they had India, they had Pakistan, they had Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Australia, New Zealand, all these areas around China. And guess what the, the, the British liked? They liked tea and they liked fine porcelain and they wanted silk. And they wanted it from China real bad and the Qing Dynasty is controlling the export of all these commodities. 
Well, and the Chinese are like, we don't really want your stuff. Your stuff is kind of crappy. <laughs> so the, the British Empire is like, well, we have opium. You guys smoke opium, right? Well, not really. So in opium in the Qing Dynasty was the elites would smoke it. Think of like the cocaine of the 1980s, right? Like only those high ranking businessmen had access to cocaine. And so opium before the opium wars was limited. It was highly expensive. Your common Chinese person would not have access to smoking opium. But guess what? India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan then and is today is a lead producer of opium. Those were British protectorates. And they said, here's a huge market that's already predicated that could smoke it if we give it to them cheap. And so that's what led to the opium wars, is the British Empire attacked China's sovereignty to force in cheap opium to export porcelains and silk and teas. That destabilized the entire country because for 200 years, the Qing Dynasty had looked inward. Meanwhile, the British Empire had become the most powerful military in the world. And so suddenly when these two parties came into contact, the Chinese had their butt kicked every single time. They had not kept it with modern technology of warfare. This led to what's called the port cities, the treaty ports or the unequal treaties, where the British Empire said, even the British Empire and their megalomania, they said, we cannot control all of China. But that wasn't their focus. They wanted to control trade in and out of China. So they secured all the port cities on the east side of China, the big ports, and they became largely foreign protectorates with very little influence from the Chinese government. So that means they could import tons of opium at a time. Well, this led, this destabilization in China led to this, open re revolution. So now all that tension for 200 years between the 20% minority and the 80% majority, now the policies of that government had so fundamentally failed that the British Empire now is basically controlling China. Southern China went into uprising. We call these the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, Taiping, uh, he was a guy that felt he was the son of Jesus Christ and he organized some folks to go rally against the, the Qing government. But it just sucked up all this inherent angst with how the government has treated them for 200 years. And so over the period of about 10 years, there was 20 million killed in the Chinese Revolution and another 30 million we would consider today refugees. The Qing prepared for 30 million people to arrive. Put it in perspective, 1850 in the United States, we had 22 million in our country. 30 million fled violence and famine in China. So they fled into these port cities, but they weren't prepared for that influx of humans. So they left. And this is what we call the great Chinese diaspora. So between 1850 and 1900, so the last half of the 19th century, estimated between 30 and 40 million Chinese left China in search of opportunity. Same as my ancestors did, same as your ancestors did. They came here into the United States looking for opportunity, but they went to Central America. They went to Hawaii and worked in pineapple and sugarcane fields. They went to Cuba and worked rolling cigars and cutting tobacco. Um, they went anywhere that they could find a job. Now the Chinese society in the 19th century was very male-based, meaning that males were the ones that were supposed to earn money for their families. This is where we have another problem arrive is we start saying all these bachelor Chinese men are coming here and they're gonna spoil our country. Those men were not bachelors. Oftentimes those men had wives, they had families, back in China that they came here to make paychecks to support. I'm gonna to talk to you about how we also created what's called the sojourner concept, where as Americans like, oh, they're gonna come here, take our money and then go home. They don't wanna stay, they don't wanna assimilate. We caused that. Many of these Chinese immigrants would have loved to have stayed in a country that was relatively safe, that they had jobs, that they could see their families. The impact of our country's legislation on the Chinese population caused a fragment in Chinese history, a disconnected two generations who had left home, and by the time they had earned enough money, oftentimes to go home, it had been 20 years, 30 years since they had seen their family. They had stopped writing letters after 10 years. They didn't know if their kids were alive. They didn't know if their wives were alive. So then they just lived 
is a place, uh, there was a Chinese man in Montana in 1938 who was quoted, I'm a man without a country. I'm not a citizen of the United States and I'm disdained because of the color of my skin and I can't go back to China because I don't know who th those people are. I left the Qing Dynasty and now it's a Republican revolution. It's a Republican state. I don't live in any world. That's the impact we had on the Chinese. So I'm gonna try not to bum all of you completely out, but it is, it is history um, and we can learn from it. That's my job as an archeologist is how can we do better by the next wave of immigrants? So if you look at this migration from 1870 to 1900, uh, about 30,000, 40,000 came from Japan, over 200,000 came from China, but then you look at the other side, 10 million came from Europe. But you know what shows up in the newspapers in the late 19th century? We're gonna be swarmed by the yellow peril. There's gonna be so Chinese everywhere. It's like 10 million or 200,000, I don't consider a risk if you're looking at numbers. But again, it was white versus non-white, right? It was a different perspective, even though when my folks, the Irish showed up, because we were Catholics, oh God help us, when we arrived in New York City. So if you were that, let's say 25 year old Chinese man, you just lost your village, your family had been attacked, many of them killed, you hadn't ate well, and you arrived in Hong Kong. And people start talking, there's a place across the ocean that you can reach your hands into the water and you can take out chunks of gold and you can keep it. Wouldn't that sound like a dream? And so the Chinese have a term for it, Gum San, Gold Mountain. That's what North America became. It was the place of everything was in gold. The streets were paved for gold. But that was the story, right? Those are the people that needed that story in order to have hope. And they came here looking for that hope. Um, so when the first wave in 1849, right, we have the gold, you know, the gold miners. We have a, a crappy football team. I'm a Broncos fan, but... <laughs> You know, it's, it's named after the, uh, you know, the gold rush, 1849. But by 1850, you saw, right, we're in the middle of the Taiping rebellions, we're in the middle of the opium wars. China was destabilized. There was millions of people looking for hope. Suddenly, the gold strikes. Chinese start coming over, small at a time. But before 1850, there was about 400 Chinese in the entire country. By the mid-1850s, we started getting into the 30,000 range. So it was a migration impact. But because of that, um, California passed a miners tax, but it only applied to those born in Asia. So um, four dollars a month just to pay to live in the state and mine. Uh, four dollars a month doesn't seem like a lot, but if you're working at maybe 50 cents a day, um, it does add up after a while. So after they arrived for the gold rush, the Chinese started going to other sectors. And in Silver Reef, Probably none of these guys went into actually mining. Hard rock mining, underground mining, largely barred Chinese from participating because most of them had either large capital, which means labor unions somehow around, or just the basic racism. And so most Chinese never worked in underground mines. I can only find one example in the US where the Chinese were used in underground mines, but they were used by the mine company to break a strike. And then guess what happened to the Chinese workers they got attacked, they got shot, they got lynched. Um, so we have the Chinese going into what's called placer mining, which is that, that loose gold that's in creeks, the old classic gold panner. That was something the Chinese could participate in because the big mines started going to the big underground works and they didn't care so much about the surface mining. Railroads, which I'm gonna talk about. Gardens, like I have no doubt in my mind that there was a Chinese garden in Silver Reef. It is an indicative part of a Chinese experience because these people were largely farmers. And guess what? All these rough and tumble, burly guys didn't really care about having fresh vegetables on the table. And so a lot of the things that you see after this were what we call mining the miners, service-based industries, laundries, restaurants, gardens. So while the Chinese were barred from participating in the mining directly, they just took it out of the pocket of the miners because they were serving a purpose. You know, a lot of these communities were largely male, white male. So they didn't have their wives or their daughters there to do those you know, feminine tasks if you look at the 19th century perspective. The Chinese men were more than happy to take those tasks because it made them income. 
Um, we do have, like I mentioned, uh, the Chinese worked in shoe factories up in Tacoma, sugar refinery in Hawaii. But let's talk Utah. So 1860, these are census records. Zero Chinese in, the in Utah territory. By 1870, we jump above 400. Guess what happened between 1860 and 1870? We built a shiny railroad on the back of 13,000 Chinese workers that finished here at Golden Spike. Uh, promontory Summit. 1880, plateau, you see Washington County bump. That's the Silver Reef effect. All those Chinese were right here. Um, during the gold or the silver boom of Silver Reef in the late 1870s, created this little influx here in Washington County, but then you see by 1890 and 1900, it disappeared again. That's a mining town history. Uh, there were probably still Chinese here, they probably just were not enumerated. Um, same as we had in the last 2020 census, the people that most likely to not be documented are those that are not citizens, that do not speak English. And so that's why, you know, Pat mentions that, well, we know maybe 100 to 200. It's because the census takers couldn't be bothered with how many Chinese were here. If you look at the census records, they're all Ah Wing, Ah Wong. That's useless from a genealogical standpoint. It's like Mr. Chris almost to that point. And so we've because of the racism, you can't even do a lot of genealogy on most Chinese that immigrated. Versus my ancestors, I can track back all the way to Ireland and all the way back to the Plymouth because our names tracked. The Chinese names didn't track in the census records. You see 1890 to 1900, a boom, drop. That was not natural. That was legislative. And I'll talk about that. Uh, Transcontinental Railroad, this is where I've done a lot of my time up on the northeast or northwest corner of the state. So in 1863, or 1862, right, you know, Lincoln passes the, the Transcontinental Railway Act connecting Sacramento to Omaha, Central Pacific coming from Sacramento, Union Pacific coming from Omaha, Nebraska. Well, the east side is mutts. They're Irish, they're Civil War veterans, they're freed slaves, they're all these folks, just mutts. The west side, they kept trying to use white folk, and they tried building out of Sacramento, and every time they got a couple hundred yards, someone would yell gold, and all their workers would disappear <laughs> into the mountains. Because who wants to swing a five pound sledge eight hours a day, or go up into the mountains and get rich? And so they couldn't keep a workforce. So Leland Stanford, the governor of California, and the Stanford University, he hated the Chinese. He was a very anti-Chinese guy. Most of the folks for the Central Pacific were anti-Chinese. But a foreman in Sacramento said, I have these hundred guys, Chinese guys, they're working on a siding, they're working, they show up to work every day, can I put them on the main line? And so sure, put them on the main line. They built three miles in a day. They spent two years building three miles. And so um, Stowbridge, who was the engineer, sent that report to Stanford. Stanford and Crocker had a meeting and he issued an edict to Chinatown in San Francisco, I want 15,000 by the end of the year and they got 13,000 in six months. That's because of that pressure in China. All these people pressing up against that glass waiting for a chance. We gave them a chance on the Transcontinental Railroad. And then from 1864 to 1869, they were three quarters of the workforce to build our Transcontinental Railroad. Spending two winters in the Sierras, tunneling out 11 tunnels, a quarter inch a day through solid granite. Those were the Chinese contributions to our nation's history. Avalanches would take work crews and they wouldn't even recover the bodies to the spring. There's still hundreds of Chinese laying at the bottom of Donner Summit that we will never know their final resting places. Um, the Chinese were hired by the number, not by the name. So my ancestor, I could find him in the census record with a work record saying so-and-so was hired as a blacksmith. You look at the Central Pacific, Wang Wing, 100 Chinamen. Here's $10,000. That was the level. It was no more than a numbers game. And so that's how we treated him. That's why today we don't know how many Chinese died building our transcontinental railroad. They didn't track the deaths. They didn't care. Like, okay, you have 90 instead of 100. Well, go find 10. It was a numbers. It wasn't people. They were no more than a pick and shovel to most of the railroad companies. After 1869, the Chinese become the stable Chinese or section crew for the entire Western United States. Every section crew maintaining the Transcontinental Railroad from Omaha to Sacramento was Chinese. Then we built the Northern Pacific, the Southern Pacific in 1882. Both of those, three quarters Chinese workforces, maintained by the Chinese after it. 
they were the functional lifeblood of our railroads, which allowed the United States to become an economic powerhouse in the 19th century, these railroads. And those Chinese workers from this situation in China were the backbone of that experience. Uh, focusing a little bit more into Salt Lake, I just wanted to highlight, this is what's called Plum Alley in Salt Lake City. You can't find Plum Alley anymore really on a map. Um, it was redeveloped in the 1950s. It was blighted. Um, the Chinese actually had to pay for their own street paving because the city did not consider Chinatown in the 1920s part of Salt Lake City. Even though this is, if you've been to Salt Lake City, you know where State Street is. You know where Second South is, so Galvin Plaza, now the new fancy Eccles Theater. It was right there, right behind the new Eccles Theater. But Salt Lake City did not consider it Salt Lake City. It tells you something about that experience. Um, but this was the urban Chinatown. Ogden had a large Chinatown, Salt Lake, uh, but both of them by the 1890s struggled. And Salt Lake's Plum Alley really dwindled by the 1930s. Um, these are Sanborn insurance maps. I just like to show these. So these are insurance maps that a company painted. So if uh, this gentleman walks in and says, I just bought a house and I need to get fire insurance, they'll pull out these huge leather bound books and they're like, what's your address? And they'll look around you and see what your fire risk is. That's old school insurance. Well, because they were Chinese, they were considered a higher fire risk. So we drew them on the insurance maps because if you live next to a Chinese laundry, you should pay more money in your taxes because the Chinese were more risk. Interesting, right? This is a temporary Chinese vegetable garden as mapped. This is fascinating. This is in downtown Salt Lake City. So you think of Salt Lake City, this big agricultural community, there was over a dozen Chinese gardens in downtown Salt Lake in the 1880s and 90s providing fresh produce for the downtown markets and hotels. The Chinese brought cucumbers to Utah. Um, it's really interesting to think about how this history is now kind of evaporated from Utah. So focusing more down to here, so this is a really awesome photo of Silver Reef, kind of over towards the cemetery, looking back towards us. Um, you can see the Wells Fargo building kind of right there. Um, Chinatown is below us kind of down the wash. Most Chinatowns were kind of on the bad side of town. They were next to the red light district. They were away from the commercial core. Silver Reef is not that much different, even though Silver Reef kind of boomed and busted quick, so you didn't have that big build out of a downtown necessarily. Um, but just to give you an idea, that's it in the 1880s. You know, that's, I overlaid a, a photo on that, and you can kind of see that same angle today. Still see the cemetery down here. The Chinese would not have been allowed to be buried in a formal cemetery. They would have been not allowed to be buried in consecrated Christian ground. And so they would have had to find a different cemetery. And we're working with Silver Reef right now to try to identify that. Um, looking more into mining in Silver Reef is we have uh, Sam Wing, who's kind of the guy here in Silver Reef. He was a merchant. Um, most of these communities would have had one or two Chinese merchants. Now remember, all the way back to the, when I started, the merchants in China had no power. Remember that? Well, guess who had all the power in the United States? Merchants. Whether you're, you know, a president who owns a bunch of companies or you're a guy that owns a store, you had power. And so Chinese merchants had huge power here in the United States because they now controlled immigration. So they could say, reach out to their uncle or cousin back in China and say, I need 50 guys for this new construction project. They would gather up largely their relatives or wherever was at the dock, put them on a boat, bring them over and start them to work. Merchants now were the brokers. Merchants now were the folks that had control of what came in. And so that put these folks in a lot of power. Uh, Chinese merchants in the 19th century wielded an amazing amount of power over the other Chinese because they were beholding to them for their economics, that's who gave them their job, but then also to practice traditional food ways and culture. You had to go to their store to get that. You're not going to find that at another dry goods store. So these folks like Sam Wing had a lot of money and power because of that control. And then this really cool 1879 plat map that these guys have uh, here at Silver Reef, you actually see Wo Lung, Wo Lung. Uh, Ying Sing Song, uh, let's see, his store, yeah, right here, Sam Wing, that was his lot right here, which would actually have been only 150 yards behind us. 
So Silver Reef is just a small portion of that national story. We boomed, we busted. That's a mining town. That's how they roll. Um, but the contribution that the Chinese had here, we don't know very much about. Because if I did newspaper research be coming down here. I'm like, I'm going to see what I get. Oh, yep, there's the story about the Chinese gamblers. Yep, every mine town has that story. Oh, there's another story about how the, the Chinese started a fire. But you actually read the newspaper article, it sounds like one of their stores got lit on fire by an arsonist. Uh, so I don't really blame the Chinese for that one. Uh, but it was how we impacted them. And so when you look at the story, it's not like, so-and-so sent a letter home to their family, right? Like my ancestor would have gotten a newspaper. It was all these sort of caricatures, not the people. And that's something that always reoccurs everywhere I, I see a Chinese story. It's very rare to learn much about a person in this history. Um, and so Silver Reef just fits into a broader scale. And so now I want to go into Bummer Town for a minute. Um, these are offensive. I'm putting it in here for that reason. This is how the Chinese were being conveyed in the 19th century. Um, this is a rat killer, where they're using a Chinese man depiction eating a rat. It's a rat killer. It's a poison. And it struck a chord with American society. On the right, there's a Harper's Weekly. This you know, crazed Chinese man with pistol and torches and a knife killing this poor, innocent Victorian woman and is going to rampage throughout our country. So only two years after the Transcontinental Railroad was finished, the United States went into an economic depression because those same two railroads both bankrupted. Well, guess what? In a recession, we start trying to find somebody's got to be to blame for why we're having economic problems. Well, who's the new one? Well, the Chinese, they are here in the thousands. They must have helped destabilize. They're driving down good wages because we can pay them less. Not blaming the companies for paying them less than the white laborers. We're not going to do that. So a lot of the rhetoric we see in the 1870s, including advertisements, newspaper articles, is what we call the yellow peril or the Chinese problem. Um, in the 1870s is when we start seeing legislation trying to attack the Chinese experience in our country. Um, and one of the first ones I want to highlight is the Page Act. So 1868, we have a Burlingame Act, which was just a handshake agreement between the U.S. and China saying, please control your immigrants. But then they're like, send as many as you can for the railroads. <laughs> we want that cheap labor. Um, so I, I maybe rewind quickly to the railroad story. So the Chinese were being paid a dollar a day to build the railroad. White crews, a dollar fifty a day. Um, when the Central Pacific said what their pay rate was, they said they were being paid equal. Well, it wasn't equal, one, in dollars, but two, the Chinese were required to hire uh, their own cooks, supply their own food, and find their own housing. The white crews had a cook house, they had food supplied, and they didn't even have to pay for their equipment. The Chinese crews had to buy their own picks and shovels in many cases. So that dollar a day gets dwindled pretty quick, right? So it's not an equal pay. Um, in the 1870s and 1880s, we get what's called the Opium Acts, which are the first attempts to really start targeting the Chinese with legal attacks. Like, how do we force them out of a community that we don't want them anymore? Well, let's make smoking of opium illegal. Well, let's talk about that elephant in the room for a minute. We call the opium, you know, Chinese and opium are one thing. Well, remember what I said before those trade wars, not many people in China smoked opium. But now, if you guys take one sociology course, or if you even watch CNN, what are the indicators of someone using drugs or alcohol? Death, trauma, pain, dispossession, refugee, right? All these social indicators of how in 2023, we see populations at high risk for drug abuse. That's what the Chinese were dealing with. But you couple it with British Empire, like, let's make opium as dirt cheap as possible, because we'll get everybody hooked on it in China. So when they arrive over here and they're smoking opium, we start like, well, look at these drug fiends. They just love drugs in China. Uh, you got to look at that bigger picture. How? Why? You know, Chinese weren't allowed to go to white doctors in the United States. So how do you break? How do you deal with a broken leg and that pain? Probably some of you in here have had a surgery and you've probably had an opiate after that surgery. Well, there's a reason you took an opiate. It's a really good pain reliever. Um, and smoking opium is actually not chemically addictive. It's just habitually addictive versus opiates, which are chemically addictive because we've refined them. 
And so connecting the Chinese to opium was a choice by our nation to allow more restriction of a single group. We, uh, we accommodate them together. I want to highlight the Page Act. Guess what? Page Act, 1875, we're in the middle of our nation's recession. The Page Act says, hey, it's an immigration law and it's dealing with some other immigration, but it said, we're not gonna allow any Chinese women to immigrate to our country because they're being brought here for immoral purposes. So they labeled all Chinese women as prostitutes. Well, remember what I said that those Chinese men came in here for a new life? You can't bring your wife now because now federal law says you can't. So now they tried to smuggle them. Then they started paying people to smuggle them. And so suddenly the newspapers caught wind of that and like, oh, Chinese man spends $10,000 on bride like, to smuggle his wife into our country. Um, it's a different connotation how you spin it, right? Um, so the Page Act cuts off the women because the one thing that was really targeted is like, well, we want the labor. We just don't want them to stay. So you took the women away. Um, 1882 is what we have in our nation is the first federal law targeting a nationality from immigration. It's what we call closing the gate. In 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which forbade the immigration of anyone from China, period. Unless you know, you're a scholar, a diplomat, or an acrobat. Um, weird categories, I know, but it's Congress. Um, <laughs> But it was the first law to target a, a Chinese or a, a nationality from immigration. By 1892, the impact of this was so dramatic. Nationwide, the Chinese population just stalled and started declining because as people were starting to go home or dying, they weren't being replaced. So 1892, when the Exclusion Act came up for renewal, Congress was like, hey, this worked out really well. What we should do now is deal with the ones here. So we passed the Geary Act which is the first federal law requiring a person to carry a photo ID at all times. Guess who had to do that? The Chinese. They were not allowed to be citizens. So you had to have your papers with you at all times. And if you were caught without your papers, deportation. The only place you could go get a photo ID was a federal courthouse. So if you were a Silver Reef Chinese man, closest federal courthouse, probably Boise, maybe Southern California, so you'd have to pay all that trip to go get a photo ID on a base wage. Most Chinese did not register because of those restrictions. So by 1900, you saw that plummet of the Chinese population in Utah. That's a nationwide plummet because there's no new immigrants coming in. Um, but guess what? There was still need. We still needed labor on these big railroad projects. And so we just found somebody else. So in the 1890s, railroad companies start targeting the Japanese. They started targeting Greeks and Italians. By the 19-teens and 20s, we started immigrating Mexicans. It was just the next immigration group. And then guess what? As that group grew, federal law to try to restrict them, or state law to try to restrict that. The Chinese were just the first view. I like to include this little newspaper clipping from Virginia City, Nevada. Come join the grand democratic anti-Chinese torchlight demonstration. How do you think that ended? It did not end well for the Chinese community in Virginia City. Chinatown was burned down through this democratic torchlight demonstration. Throughout the 1880s, we also see an increase in Chinese violence. Um, when you make somebody a beating a stick so much, at some point it's gonna flame. And suddenly it now became almost okay to attack Chinese in every corner of our country. Um, 18 men are lynched in 1871 in Los Angeles. Um, Denver, um, one dead, 50,000 in property, but they actually torched Chinatown in Denver in 1880. Tacoma, no deaths, but they actually went door to door. They passed an ordinance saying no Chinese could live within the city boundaries of Tacoma. So they went and seized the property, went and seized the men and the families, loaded their bags, took them on a train outside the outskirts and dumped them. Um, that law was on the books throughout the early 20th century as well. Uh, Rock Springs, the worst known uh, Chinese massacre in our nation's history. I'll talk about it in a second. Vancouver, Seattle, I could keep going. I could keep going. It was just violence after violence. We've had four lynchings in Utah state history, three African-Americans, one Chinese, for having relations with a white woman. 
in Corinne, Utah. He was hung off a railroad bridge. Um, so we attacked the Chinese. Uh, the Rock Springs Massacre, so the same Chinese who had such a major contribution to the building of our transcontinental railroad, the Union Pacific owned coal mines in Rock Springs, and so they used the Chinese there to actually break a strike. Um, it was very, very bad for the Chinese in the end, is the striking uh, coal miners surrounded Chinatown, marched in from three directions, and burned many of the Chinese men alive in their homes. Those that tried to flee, they shot them in the back. The Union Pacific actually brought in the Wyoming militia and National Guard to escort the remaining Chinese out of Rock Springs under armed guard. Um, it's because we sanctioned it, right? We said that was okay. Um, no real arrests or punishment were ever made on this. The worst punishment of this one is the two guys, in, in, uh, they were uh, posing as federal marshals. That's what they got them the most charge on not the actual death and murder. So let's talk about death. Sorry to bum everybody out, but um, I, wanna, I will end on a high note, I promise you. So let's talk burials. We have the same story here in Silver Reef as we have in many communities. Many of the Chinese that came here had what we called an insurance policy, that if they died here, they would be buried, and then after a two or three year period, someone would come back, unbury them, pack them up, and ship them home to their families. It's a very family-based you know, group and ancestry and death. And so if you're here with no family, you kind of exist in this no land. And so it was a very harsh reality of if I die, I need my bones to go home to my home village so I, my family can take care of me. Well, we have stories here of a, a Chinese man coming here, I forget the year, and, and excavated the cemetery. And everywhere I go, like, oh, someone came and collected all the bodies. I'm like, no, they didn't. They collected some of the bodies. There's still people in this ground. There's people that didn't have the insurance. There's people whose markers got lost. There's people that didn't have money or didn't have a family. There are people buried in every one of these old Chinese cemeteries, every single one, and we should treat them as hallowed ground. Um, you see that everywhere in the American West. Um, I've dealt with this in Helena, Montana, where they actually, they built the Chinese cemetery outside the formal cemetery in Helena, and in the 1980s, they fenced it out. So it's in this back field, and that's where they dump their grass clippings and tree branches, and there's a funerary burner and tombstones, and I'm like, there's people buried there. Oh, no, 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 the Chinese got all their dead in the 50s. I'm like, no, they didn't. I have, I have a record of 13 Chinese paupers who were dumped in a mass grave. Well, we we don't believe you. And so it took a newspaper article in the Helena Record for them to actually fence it in. Um, somebody might have said they were racist. I don't know who that would have been. Um, but, <laughs> but it's really an important story is when we think about these burial grounds, we need to think more than the stories, we need to think the reality. And there's so much of these experiences we don't know because we don't have their letters. We don't have their family history scrapbooks like many of you do. We can't go on to Ancestry.com and reconstruct a family's history. Their history, in many cases, is with them in the ground or the stuff that they left behind, the artifacts that they had in their daily lives. And as an archaeologist, that's my job. Those artifacts, to me, are a connection to a story. And I'm going way late, so I'm going quick. Um, I'm going to highlight this real quick, Angel Island. It's the Ellis Island of the Chinese experience. Um, it's off you know, in San Francisco Bay. Uh, it's where after you know, really 1900, all the boats coming in from China would be stopped. They would put them in basically prison barracks and then they would question them for months. One guy was held there for four years in order to regain entry into the United States and finally said, I'm gonna go back to China. Uh, and the questions were like, what was your grandmother's favorite chicken's name? Like all these hard, hard questions that no one could answer. And every day, they would change the questions because the point was to not let them in. And so this became the Ellis Island. And there's a really good, um, if you want to take a photo of this and type this into your computer or YouTube, look at the Angel Island because while these men are there, they carved poems and phrases into the barracks. And some of them are, are painful. Um, so let's talk positive. Um, <laughs> So Angel Island is sort of that end of the story. So after 1900, uh, we actually made the exclusion in Gary Act permanent. 
We said we don't want any Chinese in this country all until 1943. 1943, guess what? The Chinese had a little bit of a leverage. They said, you want our help in World War II? Let's change some laws. And so that's when we see the change. We see the change, we see the repeal, we see a quota system until the 1960s, and then what we consider our modern immigration laws. So we really see two periods of Chinese migration. Exclusion Act era, post-World War II, two different eras. One hardly knows much of the other because of that 50 years of racism that disconnected those entire populations. And as a scholar working in the United States, guess whose letters aren't in museums or in archives? The Chinese. They went home. Those letters are in China. And so we're just starting now to work in China to figure out those, those trans-Pacific connections. Um, but I want to say this. I worked a lot with the Chinese community. And as much as this is their history, I love working with them because they say, despite. Despite that, look at what my ancestor did. Despite this, they built a railroad. That is the right perspective. We can learn from this painful history. The descendant community today, it's, it's part of who they are. This is their story. We all contribute to the next wave of history. So how can we say that the next generation of immigrant doesn't have to use despite? That's a call. The things that we left behind, these are archeology. span This is a bamboo pattern rice bowl, your standard workers bowl. It was porcelain. The Chinese beat us to porcelain by about 2,000 years. This is a ginger jar. So this was imported dried ginger. This is the base of a uh, Chinese four flowers. These are all on the railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad. These were the things that these men, women, and even children. I have a 14-year-old kid that was listed in the census swinging a five-pound sledge 10 hours a day. Because guess what? I bet he was the oldest son still alive that had to support his family. So. These legacies are there. And the concern I have for Silver Reef, and I've expressed it to Silver Reef, is when I walk through Chinatown, there's evidence of those Chinese workers. There's bowls, there's pots, there's jars. How many have been taken by bottle hunters and looters in the last 100 years? How many will walk away in the next 10 years by people just like, oh, this is pretty. But every time we take a little piece of that history, my ability to tell a story of a completely forgotten population disappears. Every day that something walks away from an archeological site, you're ripping a page out of history that can never be put back. Because I don't know the names of every Chinese man that lived in that. I know some. But that bowl, that pot, we found peanut shells, we found coconut shells, we found ginkgo biloba seeds out on the railroad. That's telling me something. That's telling me about a person that came to our country and did something amazing, and we've all forgot. So labor transition, I already talked about that. I'm over time, so I'm fast forwarding. Um, I'd love you guys to check this out. Our uh, poet laureate, she's now a uh, former poet laureate, she was commissioned by the state to do a epic poem of the transcontinental. And she's you know, of mixed ancestry. She has you know, Chinese history in her blood. She has Japanese history in her blood. She has white history in her blood. And so she did this amazing, it's now a book, but it's also an interactive online poem. And so you can click on different characters teaching different lessons about the Chinese. And there's some amazing, amazing things that she was able to do through poetry. So thank you guys. This is uh, Representative Blake Moore who, guess what, got the same spiel I gave you guys because I'm passionate to let decision makers know. And there's something I always like to say. History and archaeology is sometimes like that 1960s Star Trek where they could slide these really racist, like attacking society's racism into sci-fi because it was more consumable. Archaeology and history can do this. I'm not talking about our issues with immigration from Mexico or Central America. I'm talking about the Chinese immigration. But if you take some of these lessons, that's on you. I'm just telling you what happened in the past. So having lawmakers out there, and he was very much moved by the same story. Brandon Flint, the superintendent of Golden Spike, uh, he's telling that story. Representative, well, she's now state senator, Karen Kwan. She's the first Chinese-American state senator. And then Margaret Yi, who's been in our country over 60 years, has been a businesswoman in Salt Lake for over 50 years, an amazing matriarch of the Chinese community. And to me, 
this is where we want, right? Everybody working together to tell the story that's been forgot by history. And so I applaud Silver Reef for having this exhibit, for the interpretation in, in the museum, for thinking and working with us to preserve what's left of the Chinese community, because we all have a reason to protect this history. It's our history. So thank you guys. <laughs>